As we work with these trig functions, it's also helpful to be familiar with how the graphs of these functions behave. Specifically in this video, we're going to take a look at the graph of sine x and cosine x. And that's basically our question as well. What do the graphs of sine x and cosine x look like? And there are actually many applications of sine and cosine graphs. And we'll take a look at some of them towards the end of this video. But first, we need to build the sine x graph. And what we know about sine x is that sine x is the y coordinate. It is the height or y coordinate. So if I draw a unit circle over here, And then right next to it, we'll draw a graph. And we'll kind of line up the height of 1 and the bottom height of negative 1, because it is a unit circle. And what we'll do, just for the sake of this graph to get an idea of what's going on, we're going to label every pi over 4 at about equidistant lengths. So we've got pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, pi, 5 pi over 4, 3 pi over 2, 7 pi over 4, and then 2 pi. Those are about equidistant apart. And what's nice about each of those distance is those distance represent the quarters and the tops and the edges of the circle. And let's go ahead and label uh, this unit circle as well. So we've got a pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, pi, 5 pi over 4, 3 pi over 2, um, 7 pi over 4, and finally 2 pi, but it's also 0 as well. And what I can do then, you notice 3 pi over 4 and 1 pi over 4 all have the same y coordinate. They all have the same height. So if I stretch that across, pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4 will have the same height. Similar, pi over 5 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4 are just down below the x-axis. So 5 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4 are low points. Pi over 2, we've already said, is kind of at the top. And 3 pi over 2, we've already said, is at the bottom. The only other observation that I see is 0 pi and 2 pi have a height of 0, so they're right on the x-axis. And so what we end up with with all these dots is a nice graph that we can connect the dots on. And we see it's kind of this nice little smooth up, down, back up. And that's where we get the idea of the graph of sine of x. Sine of x. What I want to notice, let's leave that on the screen, actually. What I want to notice about sine of x is it starts at 0, increases to 1, and that happens at pi over 2, then down to negative 1, and that happens at 3 pi over 2 then back to 0. And that happens at 2 pi. If I were to extend this graph, this graph doesn't actually necessarily stop where we stopped it. It goes, continues to go up and back down. And on the left side, it continues to go down and back up. It actually goes on forever with this wiggle shape. So let's go ahead and show what that looks like by drawing a graph that's centered in the middle here. And 
we'll label every pi over 2 because that's where the exciting stuff happens. Pi over 2 is the peaks or the valleys or the middles. So pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, 5 pi over 2, 3 pi, and then it would keep going. We can also go off on the left at negative pi over 2, negative pi, negative 3 pi over 2, negative 2 pi, negative 5 pi over 2, and negative 3 pi. And it's going to have a height of 1 or down to negative 1. We said sine starts at 0, and it increases to 1 at pi over 2. Then it's going to decrease down, hitting 0 and negative 1 at 3 pi over 2. And then increases up to 0, 1, and back down to 0. Going the other way, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0. And that happens every pi over 2. And so we end up with this curve that is the sine curve. That's just going to kind of go on and on and on, representing all the heights of the unit circle at any given point. Sine x is very similar to cosine x. Cosine, though, is the x-coordinate. And if I think about my unit circle, we're not going to build it. But cosine x being the x-coordinate, you see it should start at 1. And then the x coordinate's going to decrease. And so we end up with kind of a shift of the sine x. It's going to start at 1, decrease to negative 1, which is going to happen at pi. Then increase back to 1, which happens at 2 pi. So let's take a look at the graph of cosine of x. Same idea. We'll label pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, 5 pi over 2, and 3 pi on the right. On the left, negative pi over 2, negative pi, negative 3 pi over 2, negative 2 pi, negative 5 pi over 2, and negative 3 pi. We'll give it a height of 1 and negative 1. And the graph is going to start up at 1 because the cosine of 0 is 1. And then every pi over 2 will hit 0, negative 1. 0, 1, 0, negative 1. Going backwards, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1. And it has the same curvy shape to it. It's just kind of staggered from the sign by that distance of pi over 2. And so these are our graphs of sine of x and cosine of x. Now, as we do various transformations and translations of sine and cosine of x, it's important that we're familiar with some key terms that are going to describe these graphs. Some key terms. The first key term that we want to be able to talk about is what's called the midline. This is the horizontal line through the middle of the graph. And it usually starts at y equals 0 if there's no transformation. So if we scroll up to our sine and cosine graphs, the midline would be the x-axis, basically going right through the middle of the graph. And technically, it should be directly on top, but I have to stagger it so we can see the red line. But that red line is the 
midline. The second key term that we want to be familiar with is what's called the amplitude. And this is the height of the sine or cosine graph from the midline. And the amplitude, we usually use the letter A, starts at 1 unless there's some type of vertical or horizontal stretch on the graph. So if you see from our sine and cosine graphs, the amplitude is the height from the midline. It goes up a distance of 1. And it also goes down a distance of 1. That's the amplitude, how far up and down it's going to travel from the midline. And cosine and sine are both exactly the same. That amplitude measurement is 1. The third key term we need to know is what's called the period. The period is the distance of one revolution. And the period, we'll use p for period, starts out as being 2 pi, because that's the distance around the unit circle. That's when the graph is going to start to repeat. And what you'll see on the sine and cosine graph is if I just look at a distance of 2 pi, maybe from 0 to 2 pi, we get one revolution. On the sine graph, it goes up, down, and back up. And then that repeats over and over again. Every 2 pi, you'll see that graph is repeating. And then we're starting another period off on the left and the right. Same thing with the cosine graph. If I just look at 2 pi, you see it starts at the top, goes down, and back up to the starting. That's the period of 2 pi before the graph will start to repeat itself with another period of 2 pi. And every 2 pi, it repeats exactly the same. So those are our key terms, the midline, the amplitude, and the period. We need to be familiar with those key terms in order to transform the sine x and cosine x. And you sort of did this in pre-calc 1, where you had to transform x squared or x cubed or 1 over x by multiplying and stretching and adding and subtracting to slide it. We can do the same thing with sine of x. We'll have this general formula that a is equal to, or that f of x is equal to a sine of b times theta minus h plus k, or g of x is equal to a cosine of b theta minus h plus k. And the only difference here between f of x and g of x is the sine is going to start at 0 and increase. The cosine is going to start at 1 and decrease. What's nice about these graphs is we should be able to look at them and see that A is the amplitude or the height of the graph from the midline. If it's negative, the graph will flip upside down. So if A is negative on the sine graph, it's going to start at 0 and decrease. If a is negative on the cosine graph, it'll start at negative 1 and increase. It'll do the opposite. b changes the period. And it's not quite exactly perfect, because the period is always equal to 1 distance 2 pi divided by whatever b is. And so that's an important formula to know. You can also switch it around and say, if we need to know what b is, multiplying by b and dividing by p, we can take 2 pi divided by the period. And that'll tell us what the b should be.
h you should recognize from transforming with x squared, x cubed, 1 over x. h is the horizontal shift. And remember, it's going to go the opposite of what you expect, because it's already negative. So if it's minus 5, it shifts to the right 5. If it's plus 5, it shifts to the left 5. The horizontal shift is backwards what you'd expect. And then D, the letter K, represents the vertical shift. And actually, we usually do this first as we build our graph. Because we need to know where the midline is going to be. The vertical shift affects the midline. We need to have the midline to draw the graph up and down from that midline. So let's take a look at a few graphs and see if we can actually create them. Let's start with the graph f of x equals 3 cosine of 2x plus 1. What I can see here is the amplitude is the number out front of 3. We've got a vertical shift from the plus 1 of up 1. So I know this midline is going to be at 1, not at 0. We also see that the period has been changed because we have a b. b is equal to 2. The period is 2 pi divided by b, which is 2. So this period's been shrunk down to pi. Now, there's no horizontal shift here uh, because there's no plus um, hanging out inside that cosine. So it's still going to be horizontally where we are used to seeing it. And so let's just start our graph from 0. And let's do two revolutions of the graph. So we know that the period is pi. So I'll put pi in the middle. 2 pi would be two revolutions. And we like to split that into quarters, because that way we get our top, middle, bottom, top, middle, bottom pattern going on. So that's going to be pi over 2 and pi over 4. So 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, 3 pi over 2, and 7 pi over 4. One, two, three, four, five up, and one, two, down. Let's go three down. First thing that I'm going to put on this is we've got our midline. I said we start with the midline. The vertical shift is up one. So I'm just going to put a little dotted line as my guide. Don't confuse that with an asymptote. That's just my guide. That's the middle of this cosine graph. The amplitude is 3. So I need to go from the midline up 1, 2, 3. Um, and that's going to be the top of my graph. Down 3, 1, 2, 3 is going to be the bottom of my graph. So I'll just go ahead and put a light blue line here. That's the top and bottom of my graph. Now I'm ready to start actually graphing my points. Since there's no horizontal shift, we'll start at 0. And cosine, we know, starts at the top, normally at 1, but this time at the top of my graph. And so we've got the top on the midline is my middle. The next point is the bottom. On the midline is my middle. Top, midline, bottom, midline, top, hitting all of the points that we said on there. And that's going to give me my graph for 3 cosine 2x plus 1. And of course, it would continue on each side of the graph. It doesn't necessarily stop there.
Let's try and graph a sine graph now. Let's graph f of x is equal to 2 sine of pi x plus pi minus 3. One thing we need to be careful of with this formula is the horizontal shift is kind of hidden inside the sign because it needs to be in parentheses multiplied by the b. We have to factor out the thing in front of x. So what we're actually going to graph is 2 sine, factor out the pi of x plus 1 minus 3. And that's going to help us see all the pieces that we need. One piece that we need is the amplitude. That comes from the number up front. We're going to rise 2 from the midline. We have a vertical shift again of that midline of down 3. We also have a period shift. The period is always 2 pi divided by the b. 2 pi divided by pi is 2. So this period is actually going to be 2 wide. No pi is involved, which is nice. But this time, we also have a horizontal shift from the plus 1. That's going to move us left 1. So with the vertical shift moving us so far down, I'm going to Go ahead and graph it like this. I said we like to do at, at least two uh, revolutions. So the period is 2. So I'm going to put 2 in the middle and double that forward to get another revolution. And we're going to want to split that in half. I'm sorry, we want to split that in quarters. So 1 and 3, so we've actually got 1 half, 3 halves, 5 halves, and 7 halves as our other key points. With the horizontal shift of left 1, let's also include negative 1 half and negative 1 so we can see where those are. And then let's give us some height down, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3 negative 4, and we'll go down to negative 5. Give us a little more space to see what we're graphing. Now, the vertical shift has been negative 3. So we're going to go 1, 2, 3. Our midline is going to be down here at negative 3. The amplitude is 2. So if I count up from the midline 1, 2, we get the top of our graph. And down to, we get the bottom of our graph. And so the graph's going to kind of be in between those lines. And as we start to graph it, the horizontal shift is left 1. So it's actually going to start at that negative 1 point. And since it's a sine curve, sine normally starts at 0. Sine starts at the midline. And we know sine starts increasing to the top, to the midline, to the bottom, to the midline, to the top, to the midline. And I'm just going every single tick mark, going through this pattern, filling in my graph. And we get this nice little sine curve. And that is 2 sine pi x plus 1 minus 3. Now, I mentioned one of the great things about these graphs is they have many applications. Quite often, they can help us specifically graph how circles are moving around their center point over time. For example, the tallest Ferris wheel At least at the time of me making this video, I'm told there's one in development that's going to be taller soon, has a diameter 
of 520 feet. If the lowest point starts 30 feet in the air, it's because it's on a platform that lifts it up. It's actually on a platform. You could call it a platform. It's actually a large building. And completes a rotation. every 30 minutes, find a function to model the height over time. For this, it's going to help to draw a picture. And then we should be able to pull out of the picture all the important information of this Ferris wheel. First, we've got this Ferris wheel. It's got a diameter of 520 feet. It's also on a platform. That is 30 feet in the air. And if we were to graph this, we'll put the bottom of the graph on the ground. You can see that you get on at the bottom. You get on here at 30 feet in the air. And then you ride around, and you get up to this highest point. So you see how we can ride around to the highest point, And then you're going to come down to the bottom. In fact, let's go ahead and label the bottom of the circle and the top of the circle. And you can see how you ride the Ferris wheel in what becomes a sine or a cosine curve. Another important piece of information we need for any curve, though, is where the midline is. So let's see if we can figure out some key points. We know the entire circle has a diameter of 520 feet, which means half of the diameter is 260 feet. We're going up and down 260 feet from the midline. That tells me that the amplitude is 260 feet. We also need to know where that midline is, though. We started 30 feet in the air. And then we need to increase to the midline another 260 feet. That midline is at 290 feet. Midline is 290 feet. The other piece of information we need to know is how long does it take to complete one revolution of this graph? Basically, what's one period? We're told it completes a rotation every 30 minutes. So the period is 30 minutes. Every 30 minutes, it completes a full circle. We should be able to use this information to make our function. We know our function is going to be f of x equals a sine or cosine. Hmm, let's decide that now. This graph starts at the bottom and works up. Because it starts at the top or the bottom, that's going to be a cosine graph of b times theta plus h plus k. So plugging in the pieces we have now, a is the amplitude, 260. But cosine normally starts at the top and works down. This one starts at the bottom and works up. To get that opposite sign, we'll use a negative. So negative 260 cosine of b. Well, b comes from the period. But remember, b is equal to 2 pi divided by the period of 30. 
So b is actually going to be pi over 15. And it should actually be a minus h in the formula, right? I wrote that down wrong. Okay. Times theta, there's really no h horizontal shift. It starts at 0 where we expected it to start. Plus k, that's where the midline moved to, 290 feet. And now we have a function that should be able to predict how high a person is on this Ferris wheel. In fact, we can even ask questions now such as how high is a person after 10 minutes? So on my graph, if I split the 30 into third, 10 minutes, the person's right here somewhere. It's not really to scale. But um, it looks like it may be a little bit higher than the midline. We can find that out by plugging 10 minutes into our variable. And actually, I said f of x, so I should have an x in there. Or I could change it to f of theta. So we want to find how high after 10 minutes. Well, that's negative 260 cosine of pi over 15 times 10 plus 290. I can do that on my calculator. I want to make sure my mode is set in radians, because we did everything in radians. We've got negative 260 cosine of pi over 15 times 10, close the parentheses on the cosine, plus 290. And we find out that our height is 420 feet in the air. So today, there's two big concepts that you need to be familiar with. One, you should know what the sine and cosine graphs look like. Sine starts at 0, increasing. Or I should say sine starts at the midline and increases. Cosine starts either at the top or bottom. And then from that, you should be able to look at how to transform sine and cosine based on the amplitude, a change in period, a horizontal shift, and a vertical shift. Take a look at the homework to practice some of these. And let me know if you have any questions.